As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. This is Len Sweet here, welcoming you to the Len Talk for the 21st of May, 2023. Ascension Thursday, the Ascension Day, the celebration of the Ascension, took place on Thursday, the 18th of May. But our passage, our, our, our biblical passage this morning from the lectionary is the Ascension Passage. So we're just going to make this, and I don't know how many of you celebrate on Thursday Ascension Day, but we're going to make this an Ascension Day uh, moment and experience. And I want to just go through quickly. The, 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 the first reading is the one that we're going to use, Acts 1, 6 to 14. Then we have Psalm 68. We have the First Peter, which is the second reading. This is the great passage where the same guy who very early in Jesus' ministry woke him up from a deep sleep. Master, don't you care that we perish? And then here in First Peter 2, uh, he tells everyone, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That, that shows you that the lifelong progression of faith in Peter that took place. Gospel of John, the real Lord's Prayer, John 17. Uh, the prayer that we pray is really the disciples' prayer. This is the real Lord's Prayer. But we are going to look at the Ascension passage, and we're going to look at it in, in a way in which we, we seldom do, because we, we basically look at the, at the verses, these patchwork of 31,102 verses, without reading the story. And here, I'm going to look, I've said some nice things about the lectionary in, in recent weeks, so here I'm going to say this is the problem with the lectionary, is it's not story-based, it's not story-driven. And so it begins with uh, Acts 1, 6 to 14, but it, it leaves out the, the setting in which the ascension takes place. And if you've heard from me once, you've heard from me over and over again, that to communicate the gospel to this culture today, you've got to read the Bible in the vernacular, which means you've got to read the story cinematically. You've got to make it a motion picture in your mind. You've got to see it. So whatever you're talking about, picture it. Look at the context and, and at which it takes place. And so the passages that it, it misses are the context passages. It just starts with, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? But, but what comes before it is the setting. You got to look at the setting for the story. Are you ready? On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what is missing from the lectionary reading passage. Here's what's there. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go in Jerusalem, into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. 
which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Um, now, I, I want us to be really clear here about what, what is going on. You've got to read it carefully. When you think of where the ascension takes place, most of us think it's from a top, a top of a mountain and or the 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 mount of olives which is not really a mountain but it's just a, a mound more but we have this idea of we what we do is we confuse the transfiguration especially with the two angels that came with the ascension now the transfiguration took place when they climbed up the, this this mount this mountain the ascension took place from the mount of olives or the region of olivet uh doesn't talk about them climb up a mountain it says they return from the the region of olivet so i, I want to just begin with let's not confuse the images and many times they are in christian art uh, with the transfiguration and the ascension. The other thing that we miss is that here is, and this is what was missing in the lectionary passage. Um, it says, you ready? While he was eating with them, he gave them this command, stay in Jerusalem. And stay means like you say to a dog, stay, you don't move. Of course, they, they, um, the disciples always did what Jesus told them to. Always, always obeyed. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, all right. So here we have, wait a minute. So the ascension, uh, how, how in the world can the ascension take place while they were eating? Did they take a picnic lunch up to the top of some of this, um, you know, Mount of Olives and, and, uh, uh, just all gathered together while they're eating, and then this happened. But the, the point is, the ascension takes place at a meal. Now, you got you got to think of the, the the ancient world in the first century. They have courtyards where they would eat. They had tops of roof. The roofs were flat, and part of the the top of the the roof of the house was often a place where they would sleep at night or or gather for for meals. Um, now, they had some rooms, where houses, where they would have a special room, like a triclinium room, which was what the, the Last Supper was, the Lord's Supper, was in a triclinium room with a triclinium table. But most of the tables here are, are low to the ground. You sit on cushions, but you would eat at the table. By the way, most people in the first century ate with their... There's three ways of eating in the world, forks, fingers, and sticks. In the first century, most everybody ate with just fingers. Now, if you had... Something, it wasn't a fork, it was a spoon. Very few people had forks. Um, found very few evidences of forks. Most people that did have any kind of utensil, it was a spoon. So most of, most likely they are at table. But table doesn't mean like an inside table. It, it can mean a, a courtyard table. It can mean a roof table. Uh, but it's a tablescape. The ascension of Jesus in heaven. You say... Well, how in, the, how in the world can, you know, that's the, that's the problem with when we think inside the Bible. Everything that happens in the scriptures is mostly out of doors. Even synagogues were out of door synagogues sometimes, like the one in Nazareth. Um, so the, the, the whole the Christianity is an out of doors religion. We got to get our thinking from indoors to outdoors. By the way, I call it a good church. Get out of doors, church. We got to get we got to get some good thoughts here, some good theology. Get out of doors in our theology. And the, the significance here is that here one of the most important moments in Jesus's life, his ascended 
ascension into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. It takes place at a table. The launch pad for the ascension is a table. Notice the key importance of the table. I wrote a whole book about this, but I didn't put this in it because I didn't think about it at the time. I hadn't read it carefully enough until I was preparing for you all. Jesus, a stable is a table for Jesus. His first place was in a manger, a feed trough in the stable. It was a stable table. And then the whole, his whole ministry is revolves around table time and table talk and table ministry. His, his, his teachings were not done, his stories were not done mainly from, you know, elect, never from a lectern or something like that, or hardly ever, except in the synagogue. And even then, it was just a, it was a table. You spoke in front or in back of a table. Um, and here we have the ascension from a table. By the way, how does the story end with the marriage feast at the Supper of the Lamb? At a table. So the whole story is from beginning to end. Table. And here is one of the table moments that we miss. Jesus is eating with some of them at a table. And as he is talking to them and having conversation with them. So the question becomes, okay, where, where was Jesus eating? In this olive, Mount of Olives area, no, nobody knows. But could it, where was his favorite place? Frank Viola has written this masterful book, my favorite Frank Viola book. And I've written three books with Frank. My favorite Frank Viola book is um, his book on Bethany, God's favorite, Jesus' favorite place, God's favorite place. Where did he love to hang out? Bethany. Guess where Bethany is? There. It's two miles from Jerusalem. There in the Mount of Olives region. I suspect that this meal, this real Last Supper, before his ascension, the last supper he had on earth, was his favorite place to hang out and to eat. And it was Martha's food, wasn't Mary's. Jesus loved Martha's cooking. I think it was at Bethany. I think they had either, you know, the kitchens were outside, these outside courtyard kitchens, or there was a, from the ceiling or whatever it was, but they were eating together. And this is when he took his, his leave. Um, by the way, today... The uh, Mount of Olives situated in the West, in the West Bank. Um, so don't confuse the Transfiguration with the Ascension. They're very separate places. But, um, by the way, the Mount of Olives is, is about the only place in Jerusalem where you got a clear view of the sky. So there are, now there are other uh, candidates um, some people say it took place in Jerusalem itself. Some people say, well, it took place in the Temple Mount. Um, I, I, I think it was Bethany. It just fits with the story. It fits with Jesus. You know, Jesus, this is his, Bethany is his favorite place to hang. And these are his best friends, uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And so my candidate, but, but, the importance here is that the launch pad for life for Jesus was the table. And it's our launch pad for life. Life in the spirit. Life with an identity in Christ takes place and needs to take place at the table. The table is key. And one of the problems that we're having and why we can't retain our kids, why we can't... Where's, where, our attrition rate is atrocious. We lose our kids. It's because we haven't sat at table together and told the story. And this is one of the incredible things about this Jewish tradition of which Jesus was, was, a, was a part. Remember, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was not a Christian. 
Jesus was a Jew. Um, and as in the Jewish tradition, after the destruction of the temple in, in 70, what replaced the temple was the table. And so the most sacred rituals in the Jewish faith and in the Jewish religion took place where? At the table, presided over not by a priest or even a rabbi, but by the, the parents. And what would they do at the table? Well, let's take the Seder. They would tell the story. They would tell the story. And the whole celebration takes place around a table where they, all generations, as soon as you're born, you have a place at the table. There's no kitty table for, for in, in the Jewish faith. You have a place at the table with everyone else. In fact, the Seder begins and ends with the children. The youngest child who can speak present opens the worship. Why is this night different than all other nights? It, they open it with a question. And then when does the Seder finish? The Afikamen. When they find, they all together collectively, and the children, the, the, the child that finds the Afikamen, they don't have coloring pads at the table to keep them busy. They have this, this game where, where is the matzah hidden? And so they, they spend time just taking turns, kind of going to see if they can find where the Afikamen is. And, and the one who finds it, gets a reward, and that ends the Seder. The, the, the call to worship and the benediction are conducted by the children at a Seder meal. The children frame, bookend, the whole experience. And so from very early on, a Jewish kid, child, learns the story. And it's a religious requirement of Judaism that... When you listen to the story, this is not a story about something that happened to people in the past. This is your story. These are your relatives. These are part of your family. And when you read the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're reading your story because you need to put yourself in Abraham's place. You need to put yourself in Sarah's place. Um, you're reading your own story. So from very early on, they develop a sense of identity that comes from narrative. The last, the lasting identity, you can't build a lasting identity on views or values or virtues or verses. You need a narrative. You need a story on which to build an identity. And so by the time a Jewish child gets 12 or 13, does their bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah, they are saying yes to their identity that it comes from a story so they can spend the rest of their life being creative, being innovative. Um, our kids, by the time they get 12 or 13, we say, okay, now it's time to find yourself. And they got to come up with one from scratch. No, you been, we, we have an identity that's based on the greatest story never told because we don't know it is a story. And we aren't telling it our, at our tables. We're expecting somebody else to tell it. Expecting, oh, the, the church to tell it or Sunday school to tell it or the service to tell it. No, you tell it and you learn it at the table. And this is the significance of the table in Jesus' life and ministry. Begins at a table. The whole ministry is a table. Ascends from a table. The story ends at the marriage feast of the Lamb at a table. The, there are only 17 million Jews in the world today. A lot less than there should be. 8 billion people. If you do the math, it's two-tenths of a percent. Two-tenths of a percent. Statistically insignificant. But you look at who's responsible. Who's Who's the one that has conducted the most incredible, innovative, and creative? The, the artists, the scientists, the, when the Nobel Prizes come out, what percent go? The, 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 these kids, because they've got this sense of identity, they, they know who they are so they can be creative. And all oh, they spent their young years in where all this energy is is being dissipated for us and oh I gotta find myself I gotta build my story from scratch I gotta build my day I'll take something from here 
you know how much, you know how much time it? And so her Jewish child, Simon Shama, or Shama, depending on how you pronounce it, the British historian, was asked by BBC and PBS to do a story of the Jews. Why is this small, infinitesimal part of the world's population, why are they responsible for the bulk of the world's progress? And, and what ties them all together? I mean, is, Jew, is, is Judaism a race? Is it a nationality? Is it a religion? Is it a culture? What is it? Because you got people who are atheists who are Jews. You got people who are observant who are Jews, various levels of um, observancy. You got people who are just cultural Jews. You got, but they're all a Jew. They all have this identity. I'm a Jew. Yeah, I'm an atheist Jew, but I'm a Jew. And so he he explained it in a two volume series. He took what he did for PBS and 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 uh, and uh, BBC, put in a two volume book. It's called The Story. What ties Jews together from all over the world, from whatever walk of life they end up in, is the story. That's the build. That's the building block of their identity. And that's what this. That's what Jesus tried to teach us here in. And how he's born, how he lives, how and the last thing he does before he dies on the cross for us, and how he ascends into heaven, and what we have to look forward to in the future in heaven. It's all about the, the table. I um I recently uh, I've not seen this, um, but there's a a 2020 play, Leopold Stock, by Tom Stoppard. Uh, Tom Stoppard is um, one of the leading playwrights of our day. He was knighted in 1999, I think. He's now 85 years of age. But he came out with this incredible play in 2020, called Leopoldstadt. Now, Leopoldstadt is a Jewish quarter of Vienna. And the play starts in 1889. It goes to 1939. So you got 50 years. And it's a two-hour play. So you get 50 years in two hours. And it, it was so successful. It got the most nominations for a Tony Award. It got the, the Lawrence Olivier um, Golden something award, I don't know, it's going it to be golden award, but best new play of 2020. And um, it is, it tells of multiple generations what it means to be Jewish, even though you lose um, your ostensible Jewish religion, yet you still remain Jewish. You may lose your faith, but you don't lose your identity. And so it's a, it's a play that gets at the heart of what I'm talking about um, today in this revelation to me, this epiphany, that the ascension was another table moment in the life of Jesus. The British playwright and comedian, um, David Badil, tells of going to the play. And he he writes a review of it, of what it was like for him to see this. Now, he is a proud atheist. He, he, he sees himself with Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and others. Um, that this God thing is just a superstition and, and fanciful. But he's, he's a Jew. And it's always been a conflict for him. I'm a Jew, but I don't believe any of Judaism. And how can this be? And this is his, I'm reading from his review now that was just written, it was published in April um, last month. When I watched the play, this moment where the children go to find the Afikaman destroyed me. I wept. I sat in my seat as the lights came up. I was unable to move. I, I, I felt, in truth, anger as other theatergoers, non-Jews, just got up and collected their coats and programs and left. 
annoyed reasonably that I was blocking their way, but I'm telling you all of this because I want to make it clear, perhaps to myself, because it confuses me at times too, just how Jewish, despite or rather through my atheism, I am. And how am I Jewish? Through ritual, language, stories, poetry, the magic of it all. Remembering satyrs at my childhood house, hunting excitedly with my brothers for the afikamen. It gets in the DNA, the story from the table. Brothers and sisters, parents, bring back the table. Table it in your life, in the life of your family, in the life, I don't care whether you're, what kind of a family you have, whether it's one generation, two generation, three generations, or you and a dog and a friend. It's still, you, this is, the table is the place where you learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Um. The very metaphors for Jesus, the bread of life, the cup of salvation, are food metaphors, table metaphors. And if you remember, the story begins, Cain's a farmer, Abel's a shepherd. You got bread and lamb for the very beginning. Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus, the, the lamb of God. For the first 250 years, where did worship take place? At the table. They gathered for liturgies and homes. Many of these households were headed by women because the husbands had died. The story of Jesus is a table story. Table it in your life. And here, the ascension. First thing Jesus does when he's born is put into a feeding trough, a table for animals, the stable table. The last thing Jesus does before he ascends into heaven is table it with his friends. Let's bring back the table. Let's celebrate the one who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty with open wounds, gaping wounds, interceding for us as we sit at our tables, interceding for the wounds of those sitting at our table with us and the wounds of this world. Table it.